Good afternoon. It is my honor to introduce to you Ben Horowitz, our speaker today. Ben is the founder and general partner of, Hor of Andreessen Horowitz, a new venture capital firm that he will talk about. But prior to um, starting this company, Ben was the founder, president, and CEO of Opsware, a very successful company that he also co-founded with uh, Mark Andreessen and uh, was sold, a, I believe in 2007, to Hewlett Packard for $1.6 billion. And before Opsware, Ben actually met Mark Andreessen at um, Netscape in early 1995, before Netscape went public. And you know, as probably many of you know or remember, um, that was really the definitive internet web company of the 90s that really made everything happen and possible that we take very much for granted now. So Ben, thank you very much for being here with us today. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm here and I'm going to talk about building a technology company. And I actually originally uh, titled this presentation, How to Build a Technology Company. And I realized that was silly because it's kind of like giving a presentation on how to play quarterback in the NFL. Um, if you went to a presentation on something like that and went out there, you'd probably get killed. And the same thing is true here. It's a very dynamic endeavor. Um, so this is just kind of much more uh, my experience in doing it. And then what we look for now in new entrepreneurs who are trying to do the same thing. So uh, today's talk is basically going to be three parts. One, my own experience. Um, secondly, uh, and I will say on my own experience, I'm going to give you the uh, things that went wrong as well as the things that went right. So it'll be a little different than some of the uh, business cases that you might be used to. Um, secondly, I'm going to talk about and discuss, is it a good idea to start a company now? Or is it too late? Are all the good ideas gone? Um, because there's been a lot of articles lately about, gee, is uh, venture capital over? Is entrepreneurship over? Is technology over? Um, and so we'll talk about that. You obviously know where I come out since I just started a new venture capital firm. And I'll talk about what we look for there. Um, so I'm back home, actually. Uh, that's where I went to high school, Berkeley High School. Uh, <laughs> go Yellow Jackets. Um, and uh, so after Berkeley High School, I, uh, went and got, I got my degree from Columbia University in computer science. And back in those days, computer science was actually a somewhat controversial degree in academia, if you can believe it, because a lot of the academics thought that it wasn't like real engineering. That it was just like, how can you have a degree uh, based on like the tools you use to actually uh, you know, use a computer. The computer, like electrical engineering, that's a degree. That's a manly degree. Not like a little wimpy degree like computer science. And those of you who are taking computer science are probably going, wow, that's idiotic. Um, but the, the funny thing is it wasn't just in academia that they thought computer science, you know, and software in particular, wasn't that serious an endeavor, but in industry as well. And when you think about, gee, how did IBM just give the PC operating system business to Microsoft. Um, the real mistake they made was they thought software is just a little thing that came free with your computer, um, like all of software, the entire field, uh, and that the computer was really where it's at. So that turned out to be a really good decision to go into what at the time was a controversial degree, which was to get a degree in computer science. After that, uh, I went to UCLA and got a master's in computer science. and. Um, I will say this about degrees, because some of you are probably worried, should, am I studying the right thing? Should I be studying you know, networks, artificial intelligence? Should I be studying business? What should I be doing? And I just want to say that I, was, I founded a company, uh, as you heard. I was CEO of that company. That was a public company. I was CEO of a public company for six years. Uh, we sold that company to Hewlett Packard for $1.6 billion. And I have yet to take my first business course. So don't get too stressed. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that path, but you may like it. OK, so there is a picture of me and Warren Buffett. And despite what you might think, um, I, I didn't put it up there because we're both extremely handsome. <laughs> um, and I didn't even put it up there because he is, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's on and again, off again, the richest man in the world. And he's uh, certainly the most storied investor of our time. But he also happens to be like quite hilarious. So I, and he tells this story 
um, about business that I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you guys. So what Warren Buffett says is, look, the best thing about being rich is that you don't have to do business with people who you don't like. Because doing business with people you don't like is kind of like marrying for the money. Probably not a good idea in any case, but if you're already rich, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so that's Warren Buffett, a little words of wisdom. Um, so now we're going to get into my story and how I built the company. But before I do that, I want to give you some more words of wisdom. That's me and the king of pop, the late great king of pop, Michael Jackson. And once again, um, although he is very handsome, uh, that's not why he's up there. So the first thing to understand when you think about building a company is, uh, is uh, something that comes from a meeting that I had with him. So in this picture, I went down to he was getting into the internet. Um, and he wanted to learn all about the internet, so he thought it would be a good idea to meet with me. Um, which maybe wasn't such a good idea, but anyway, I enjoyed it. And so I went down to meet with Michael Jackson, and he couldn't have been less interested in business, like, couldn't have been less interested in business, and so we really didn't have that much to talk about. Um, but fortunately, just a week earlier, I had watched The Wiz, um, which, for those of you who don't know, is a musical that was turned into a movie starring Michael Jackson as the Scarecrow. And in The Wiz, um, he does this spin move on the yellow brick road that is like the best spin move you could ever imagine. It's way better than the moonwalk or anything else he did, but nobody ever talks about it because it was in The Wiz and nobody liked The Wiz the movie. Um, so I said, hey, Michael, I was watching The Wiz last week and that spin you did on the yellow brick road, that was like better than anything I've seen from like a ballerina or anybody. That was awesome. And he goes, oh yeah? And not only that, it was way harder than it looked because I had to go uphill. The yellow brick road was actually on a slant. And I was like, no way. It's like, way. Um, but that's the biggest lesson about building a company. It's harder than it looks, just like spinning up the yellow brick road. <laughs> All right. OK, so now I'm going to actually get into the presentation. Uh, so conventional wisdom on how to build a company. What are some of the things that people say? Well, you might get an MBA. You might come up with a good idea. You might write a detailed business plan about that idea. You might carefully test the idea and refine it. You might get the business to profitability and then grow it. Um, is that right? I don't know, because I didn't do any of that. Uh, so what do you need uh, to build a new technology company? I think there's really two things that are very consistent with every good one that's ever been built. Um, so what does matter? Number one, you have to build a transformational product. There is no way to build a great new company without a great new product. Because you know, I'll tell you now, Microsoft, IBM, Hewlett Packard, they can all hire people, they can all train people, they can all sell, they can all market. Um, what they all have trouble doing is innovating, coming up with something like truly new, truly transformational. And it's got to be way better uh, than what's out there, or way better than the current way of doing things. Um, and since I'm at Berkeley, um, I'll point out that technology, when you talk about technology from an Etymology standpoint, uh, technology literally means a better way of doing things. So when you're in this business, if you're in the technology business, the first thing that you have to do, the, the fundamental thing that you have to do is come up with something that's way, way better than what anybody's done before or what anybody's doing currently. And if you have that, then you have a chance of building a company around it. Um, but without that, you're not going to get anywhere. So products matter. That's the first thing. And because you'll hear a lot of people say, what's really important is a business model, or what's really important is marketing, or what's really important is this or that. But what's really important is the product. That really is the main thing. And that doesn't end, um, actually, with starting a company. So if you look at the great technology companies, the thing that distinguishes them is the ability to keep coming up with a better way of doing things. Uh, and I'll give you a really good example. So those of you, most of you know Apple Computer um, because they make a lot of great products. Um, but the story of what happened at Apple Computer uh, was they started out to be a great technology company and they were run uh, by their founder, Steve Jobs, who was the product visionary. Um, and then as Apple got big, the people, uh, including Steve Jobs, decided, gee, this is too big. I don't know how to run a company. I don't have a business sense. I don't know how to do it. Let's bring in a real executive. And they brought in John Scully, who was an executive at Pepsi. Um, so these were the early days when you thought it was a good idea from someone from Pepsi to run Apple. Uh, and so John Scully proceeded to 
run Apple in the way that a lot of uh, professional business people might run Apple, which is to not really uh, come up with better ways of doing things. And so once the product cycle that Steve Jobs had created, and then along the way, John Scully fired Steve Jobs uh, because he was in the way. And he was kind of a, kind of a dick. But <laughs> he was very innovative uh, and very important to the company. Um, so after he fired Steve Jobs, Apple started to fall apart. And by the late 90s, Apple's was very close to bankruptcy, like had completely imploded. And they'd missed product cycle after product cycle after product cycle. Now, if you go back and read the articles, if you go back and read Business Week or Fortune, or you read anything from like any of the analysts of the time, the Gartner Group or what have you, they all had the same analysis of Apple. What was wrong with Apple was they didn't take the Mac OS and make it available on all computers. They tied it to the hardware. And the right thing to do was to separate the operating system from the hardware. And it was completely uniform conventional wisdom. Well, so. They tried that. Gil Emilio came in and he like moved the, you know, put the OS on other computers. But the truth of it was that wasn't the problem, and it was too late anyway. Like it might have been the problem in 1985, but it wasn't the problem in 1999. Um, that wasn't the problem with Apple anymore because like Microsoft's operating system that ran on lots of computers had gotten pretty good and was almost as good as Mac OS, and it just wasn't the thing. So then Steve Jobs came back in. Funny thing happened. Uh, through an acquisition, and then he ran a coup and overtook Gil Emilio, and to the joy of all people who use technology, took back over the company. And when he did that, um, he did a funny thing. He got rid of all the clone manufacturers, the people who were using Apple OS on other computers. He said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to forget the horizontal strategy that everybody thought was the right strategy for us, and we're just going to like build better products. And in building better products, Ironically, the strategy made them completely vertical. So like, not only did he put the computer and the operating system together, like he added a music player, and he had a store. And he made it more and more vertical, exactly the opposite of what, of what everybody said. But what he did do was he started making good products. And so from a bankrupt company that had to have some like elaborate kind of structural, industry structure strategy to get itself out of by separating the operating system from the hardware, like, none of that worked. What worked was building a better product. And what always works is having a better product. And that's what the technology business really is about. Um, so before I get to my second bullet, I've got to tell you a story. Hopefully, you don't mind the stories. OK, stories. OK. Um, because when I wrote the second bullet, like, it turned out to be an inside joke. And so I said, well, I better rewrite it, because these guys aren't going to understand the joke. But why not tell you the story? Uh, so there's a famous boxer by the name of Bernard Hopkins. And he's a, you know, one of the great boxers of our era. But before uh, he became a boxer, he was in prison for about five years. And so people are always wanting, you know, when they interview him, they always ask him, you know, what was prison like? Like, that's a question you can just answer. What was prison like? I don't know. Um, so they asked Bernard, they said, you know, what was it like in prison? And Bernard Hopkins says, well, you know that movie with Tom Hanks, A League of Their Own, with the women baseball team? The guy says, yeah. He says, well, you know how Tom Hanks says there's no crying in baseball? The guy goes, yeah. He says, well, there's definitely no crying in prison. <laughs> That's what prison is like. So with that in mind, um, the second thing that you need to do is you need to take the market. Um, and, why do you need, and by taking the market, you have to win the market. So you can come up with the best product. But if you don't win, you really don't have a company. Um, and the reason is there's no crying in baseball, and there's definitely no profits for number two in technology. Like, that's just the way, you know, that is the way it works. Because most of the technology business are network effects business. Meaning if I, you know, if I buy Microsoft Word, it's much more valuable for you to own Microsoft Word because we're compatible with each other. And so there's no room for Word Perfect, the number two. Um, similarly, like, who's the number two networking company? Who's the number two database company? Do they make any money? Generally, the answer is no. Um, so number two is taking the market. And by that, I mean winning the market. You have to win. And when you think about, if you're an engineer, what business skills do you need to build a technology company? They're all around the skills you need to win the market. How do you outmarket, outsell, and beat the competition? That's ingredient two. And those are the two things that really matter. Can you build a product that's better than anybody else's and better than the current experience by enough that people will actually change? And then two, 
do you take the market? Do you beat the competition? Do you build a good enough company that you go win? So starting loud cloud and opsware. So my story. Now we're getting to my story. Uh, so how do I get to be CEO? Um, and this is, I think, an important thing that I just want to point out. So in America is a little different than other countries in that um, the way CEOs are portrayed is a little different. You know, normally they're a little more respected. For example, they actually did a study in the U.S. and on U.S. television in the 80s and 90s, 90% 90 of murders on television were committed by CEOs. <laughs> and so as part of, you know, as an extension of that, a lot of people will think, gee, if I want to run a company, if I want to be a CEO, then I need to be ruthless and I may need to be criminal. Um, but that's not actually true. In fact, it's pretty far from being true in that if you work your way backwards and say, what is the fundamental thing that's required of a CEO? What's the fundamental thing that you have to be able to do in order to be CEO is you, people have to want to work for you. Like, that's it. Because if nobody wants to work for you, you're a CEO by yourself, right? Like, you can't actually do anything. And so how do you, why would anybody want to work for a person? Well, do they have good vision? Do they care about my interests and not just theirs? You know, like, are they somebody that I can get behind? These are the questions people ask of themselves. So to be a good CEO, you actually want to do the opposite of what's portrayed on TV. Um, and you don't want to be ruthless. And you don't really want to be a dick, because nobody wants to work for that. And of course, Warren Buffett will never do business with you either, because it's like marrying for the money. Um, so to be a CEO, you, you have to, at some point, people have to want to work for you. That's a fundamental skill that you have to have. Um, secondly, the founding team. What, does, what ought to the founding team look like? And in technology companies, an ideal founding team is usually two people. And the two people are of two different types. So one, you need an inventor. And it's the inventor's job to build the product that's 10 times better than any other product that's ever been built in the space or anything better, uh, 10 times better than anything that's available to solve that problem. And then you need an entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur's job is to take the market. And so if you think about uh, the company, you know, that the companies that I founded, so my partner, Mark Andreessen, he was the inventor. Um, and I was the entrepreneur. Now, what helped a lot for us is that as the entrepreneur, I've got a master's degree in computer science, so I understood invention. And I understood how to drive the company around continuous innovation. And that's really, really important. And Mark, um, although he was the inventor, um, you know, and he like, invented the browser and a lot of important things, he knows a lot about business. And he knows a lot about taking markets. And he knows a lot about competition. And so the best thing to do is have two people who know how to do both, but at least one person who's world class in each. And that's how you think about the founding team. Um, and so then, OK, so you've got that. I get it. Build a great product. Be ready to win the market. Put together the team that can do that. How did we start the company? And really, like, that's the easiest thing. Like, starting a company is all about having the courage to do so. Like, there's not really more to it than that. It is really easy. It's never been easier to start a company. Um, you know, you just say, hey, I want to start a company. Then, like, then it gets hard. Once you've started it, then you've got to go get money and do all these other things. But starting a company, um, we really just sat around and we said, you want to start a company? And that was that. Um, so let me tell you, I'm going to take you through a brief history of that company. Um, so starting at, at the founding, so the idea that we had to start Opsor and Loud Cloud was we were all at a company called America Online at the time, which some of you may remember and is still actually around, believe it or not. Uh, but that was the company that acquired Netscape, which was our prior company. And while at America Online in 1999, we ran into this problem, um, which is there was a site, Shop at AOL. And Shop at AOL was the biggest e-commerce site on the internet, bigger than Amazon at the time. And we were running it. And what would happen is every time we'd sign up a partner for Shop at AOL, because it was really just a shopping mall, so we'd have like Barnes and Noble as a partner and uh, Toys R Us as a partner, we would hand them the AOL traffic, and their site would collapse. 
And when we went and looked at, gee, why are their sites collapsing, what we found is like none of them knew actually how to like run these new sites. And at that time, like multi-tier architectures were new, storage area networks were new, application servers were like barely invented. Um, and so people didn't know how to build these things. And we thought, gee, wouldn't it be a good idea if somebody built something to do it for them, we could call it a cloud. Like it could be like cloud computing and it would be called loud cloud. And like we thought that was a really good idea. And so we started the company. Um, and it was a really good idea. It was just like 10 years too early. And it's not a good idea to be 10 years too early in technology. Don't do that. That's bad. <laughs> so then what happened? Well, so very, we were in what's known as the internet bubble. And oh, no, by the way, this is a chart I should point out of our market capitalization. And that's in, uh, so, you know, a thousand is a billion, so it's in thousands. Um, and if you turn it upside down, that's a chart of my blood pressure <laughs> during that period. Um, so two months after founding, we raised money from Benchmark, basically on the pedigree of the founders um, at a valuation that, you know, basically was eye-popping for us of $66 million. So the company, two months after we said, hey, let's start a company, like we were $66 million, which is a lot of money. It's even a lot of money to me now. Um, then uh, the business initially took off. Everybody thought it, it was the bubble. Everybody thought cloud computing was a great idea. We booked a ton of business. We had uh, $12 million in bookings in our first f four months after we started the company. So we started the company, and four months later, Loud Cloud, the cloud computing business, had uh, uh, $12 million in bookings and like lots of customers, and it was going great. Like it was like the business went off, and then. Nine months after founding, when we did Series C, we raised money at $820 million valuation, which like, was ridiculous and stupid and silly. Um, and we thought people had lost their minds, and they had. Um, but like, that's where we went. And the problem with raising money at the high valuation like that is people expect you to build a really big company. And the problem with people expecting you to build a really big company is they expect you to spend all of the money that you raise really, really fast. Um, which we did, uh, which caused a little bit of a problem later on. Uh, so then, shortly thereafter, the so-called bubble burst. And the impact of the bubble bursting for us was about half of our customers uh, went out of business, like literally went poof, um, which is bad if you're a cloud computing company because you've basically provisioned and purchased a lot of infrastructure to run all those companies. Uh, Nonetheless, and you can see as we slide down, we took the company public uh, in 2001. And interesting fact about that, in 2001, there were only two IPOs in technology, LoudCloud and PayPal. And I'm very good friends with the PayPal guys, and they were similarly traumatized. Uh, and our, also, ironically, we both sold our companies for the exact same amount of money, PayPal and us. So, like, but that was it. That was all the IPOs, and then they cut it off. They said, stop the madness and the bubble. You guys are retarded. You're stealing all our money. <laughs> Go home. Um, and so after the IPO, um, things got worse and worse in our sector. And the big thing, so just to give you an idea, our main competitor, Exodus, which was the big data center company, the aptly named data center company, because that's basically what happened with their customers, Exodus. Um, <laughs> In January of 2002, or in January of 2001, raised $900 million, $900 million against what they claimed was an already fully funded plan. So they raised $900 million for expansion. They were worth $50 billion as a company. Nine months later, they went bankrupt. Like, that's how dramatic like, the fall off was. It was Horrible, like horrible. When you look there, I'm laughing. I'm like, it was horrible, but like it was really horrible. <laughs> and so we started to slide as well, and we were going to go bankrupt. Um, there was no question. Like we, there was just we basically found a market of cloud computing, and that market disappeared overnight. Particularly cloud computing from a semi-viable provider, which is what we were. Um, and so as we were on our way to certain bankruptcy, um, I was sitting there going, okay. You know, sometimes when you 
have something really bad happen to you or something really bad about to happen to you, one of the things I like to do is I ask myself, how, how, how bad is this really? How bad could this be? Is it really that bad? Should you really be uh, up at 3 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat? Like, are you really uh, acting correctly? And so I said to myself, how bad could this be? And I thought, well, we're going to go bankrupt. This is going to be really embarrassing. OK, I've been embarrassed before. I'm going to have to lay off all the employees. That's going to be really horrible and horrifying. Um, I'll never be able to do this again, because I will have burned through all of that cash that I raised at a very high valuation. And I was thinking, you know, this isn't making me feel any better. <laughs> and so I thought, well, what if before we go bankrupt, before we actually run completely out of cash, like, uh, is there something I can do? And I said, well, what am I going to do once we go bankrupt? And I thought, well, once we go bankrupt, what I could do is I could take, buy the software that we use to run the cloud. I could buy that out of bankruptcy, and I could start a software company. That would be a good idea. And then I thought, well, what if I could do that before we go bankrupt? And so that was like the best idea I've ever had in my life. Um, and so as a result of that, I sold the cloud computing business to EDS, which was the basically service that ran the cloud. And then I took the software, and we became a software company, Opsware. And Opsware went from, at the bottom there, 35 cents a share. We were worth about 30 million bucks to 1.6 billion dollars in the sale to HP. And hooray, we were all happy. So that's the story of Loud Cloud. Um, and I'm sweating just thinking about it. So here's another good picture. Now, in this picture, there actually are two handsome people, Bill Clinton, and there's my uh, lovely wife. Um, and so you're going, why are you showing me all these pictures of famous people? You really have a lot of problems. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, a picture about leadership. So the, the last thought I want to leave you with in building a company, there's, I often get asked, what's more important, leadership or management? And I always thought Bill Clinton was a much better leader than he ever was a manager. Um, and if you're starting a technology company, the key ingredient really is leadership. Uh, because there's just not that much to manage at first. And you can learn. Management is a little easier to learn, um, although you can learn leadership. But the, the, and the key ingredient in leadership is really something that a guy who used to work for Bill Clinton, uh, Colin Powell, said, which is leadership is the ability to get people to follow you if only out of curiosity. You guys need to come on. I need a better reaction than that. That's like one of the greatest things ever. And that really is what it is. Because there's so many times when you're building one of these things that there's absolutely no reason for the employees to stay with you. There's no reason for anybody to listen to what you're saying. And so all you can do is keep them curious enough in what's going to happen next to keep them on board. All right. So next part of the, the uh, talk. Is it too late? Like, did I miss the boat? Like, is it all invented? Gee, I wish I had thought of Facebook. Good grief now. There's never going to be a Facebook again. It's all over. Um, and you guys are laughing. But you know, there's been a lot of articles about, like, gee, there's no more venture capital. There's no more innovation. Like, it's too late. And probably many of you have roommates or fraternity mates or friends who go, why are you going into computers? Isn't it all done? I've got everything I need. I've got my computer. I've got my iPod. I've got my iPhone. Like, what else is there to build? I think I've got all the technology I need. Has anybody ever heard that? Yeah. yeah, you guys have heard that. OK, so I'm going to tell you how to. So, and it's an interesting rhetorical question. How much do we need? Like, how much of this stuff, like, when is enough enough? Um, so I, and I think the best way to look at a rhetorical question like that is to move back through history. So if you go back to 1843, this is a quote from Henry Ellsworth, who ran the patent office. And it's a fr famous quote. And basically, and in Henry Ellsworth's defense, he was basically echoing what he had been hearing. So there were a lot of people who wanted to shut down the patent office because they were like, it's over. We've invented everything. It's done. Just stop. Like, it's 1843, for crying out loud. We've invented all there is to invent. There's nothing left to invent. We don't need patents. For... <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good ringtone, whoever is. <laughs> um, it's another earlier thing. So 1936, John Maynard Keynes, generally considered, or at least in the conversation, of the greatest economist in the last 100 years. And this is not one of the smarter things that he said. Um, but basically, what he was saying here is, once people's needs are met, like his big possibility, he said, once people's needs are met, once they've got food, once they've got shelter, 
once they've got like the basic things taken care of, um, then A, they're not going to want to work anymore. So like why work if you've got your basic needs met? You're going to work much fewer hours. And two, as a result of that, they're going to save an enormous amount of money because like they're going to be making so much money and their needs are all going to be met and there's going to be nothing to buy. And so he predicted two things, that one, in the next 50 years, people would work a lot less, and two, the savings rate would go way up. So those of you who know economics are probably the ones who are laughing because, of course, the exact opposite happened. So like, why did he get that so wrong? Well, in 1936, he didn't think you needed a washing machine. He didn't think you needed a color TV. He didn't think you needed a car for every person in your house. He didn't think you needed an iPhone. He didn't think you needed any of that. Those weren't needs. Those were wants. Well, what we've learned through history is needs turn into wants. And wants and needs, there isn't actually a line between them. Like a need can quickly become a want. I need Gucci shoes. Well, <laughs> maybe I don't need Gucci shoes. <laughs> but that's how it happens. And my favorite example of this is how many microprocessors do you need in your automobile? 20. 20? Yeah. So and my next question, is, and people usually say 20 is actually pretty aggressive. Like uh, for an engine, that, that's got to be an engineer. You must be an engineer to say you need 20 microprocessors. Most people wouldn't think they'd need that. But then do you need anti-lock brakes? Do you need an airbag? Do you need a navigation system? Do you need your CD player? Do you need, there are an average automobile has 50 microprocessors in it today. Average hybrid, well over three times that. And so, and actually a hybrid is more of a computer than a car. Well, do you need that? Do we need hybrids? Well, like some people think, yeah, we need hybrids. So now you need 150 microprocessors in your car. And so what a need is, um, is definitely up to the imagination of the person. And there's not really a line between wants and needs. This is my favorite. <clears throat> so in 2003, this is 2003, right? So this is before cloud computing, before virtualization, before social networking, before like everything that's like taken off. This is from Nicholas Carr. Nicholas Carr uh, wrote this for the Harvard Business Review. IT has become a commodity, affordable and accessible to everyone that no longer offers strategic value to anyone. 2003. So when I read this in 2003, I thought, wow, how could someone from Harvard write something so stupid? <laughs> but then as I started, started to think about it more, I thought, Ah, of course, only someone from Harvard could write something that stupid. <laughs> because if it was anyone who wasn't from Harvard, somebody would tell them, hey, you're an idiot. Don't write that. <laughs> um, but can, <laughs> so you know I'm telling the truth. Um, so, so anyway, uh, so people continually underestimate what's going on. And then if you look at what's really happening, so this is a chart of patents granted in the US. Like, so that's what's really happening on invention. Like, that's a patent curve. Now, there are a lot of, there's this new thing called patent trolling. So there's more patents than there used to be. But like, that's still an impressive curve. Um, that is nodes on the internet. Like, oh, -ho. like, so that might create a few opportunities for invention. Um, just that growth a lot, just that growth alone, but invention is what's also driving that growth, so it's a virtuous cycle, it's a loop. And I actually had like 50 of these uh, kinds of slides to show you, but in reality, um, we're in, innovation is accelerating, and the opportunities are multiplying. So if technology isn't dead, then why are smart people so stupid? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? Uh, so the first thing is because investors, people who are looking at it from an economic standpoint, turn out to be highly emotional. And this was a very tricky thing for me to learn because I always thought with their fancy suits and with their like fancy words, investors were like really logical. But it's just the opposite. They're like highly emotional. Technology is definitely not emotional. Technology, whether like people are feeling good about it or people are feeling bad about it, or like people want to jump out the window, or people want to like invest all their money in it. It just keeps going at, you know, it just keeps going. And let me give you a couple of examples of this and, and how it interrelated with people's emotions and stock prices and funding of venture capital. The first is the PC. So the PC was invented, you know, really in the late 70s. Uh, and then by 1980, like investors got wind of it. 
And by 1983, there were 300 companies just making disk drives for PCs. Like everybody thought it was the greatest invention of all times and they were gonna invest all their money in it and venture capital exploded and it was all great. But the funny thing about it was like the PC really wasn't very useful to anybody. In fact, the main way they marketed it was it was a way to save your recipes. Like if you didn't want like a box with like, people used to save them a box with little cards. And like, so now you could keep them like in your PC. Like, and that was a big application and like that was it. Um, and as a result, like the PC didn't do real well as a product. And people were like, oh, like it's not doing very well as a product. And investors got like completely, they were like, nobody's ever gonna want, why would any person want a computer? And like they got completely despondent. Venture capital fell by two thirds. By 1987, venture capital was only one third of what it was in 1983. And like the stock market was totally like through with it and it was horrible and nobody wanted a PC. Well, Funny thing happened, the technology kept getting a little better, kept getting a little better. And by 1990, you had Intel 386, which was a pretty powerful chip, and you had Windows 3.0, which was like not as horrible as Windows 2.0, but like, you know, still not that great, but uh, quite a lot better. And the PC started to become useful. And the growth of the PC all occurred starting in 1990 when the product got good enough. Second example is the internet. So the internet, so my friend Mark at University of Illinois, you know, Mosaic, 1993, um, they came out with Mosaic, and then like two years later, 1995, you know, Netscape goes public. All the investors get wind of it. We've got the internet bubble. Like, you know, it's great. Like everybody's moving to Silicon Valley to start their own dot com. Like it was awesome. And then like, guess what? The technology wasn't quite there yet. It just wasn't quite there. A friend of mine, Josh Silverman, had a company called Evite. Some of you probably still use Evite today. There were like 250 engineers at Evite because like the technology, that was what was required for a greeting card, like for, like, you know, like for an invite. Like you, now you could do that like any two of you guys could go build Evite, right, today. Um, but that was the state of technology. It was just really hard to build anything at scale because nobody had been delivering things to millions and millions of users. And so everybody got despondent. All the movies, all the jokes and all the movies of the time were like, oh, you went to a dot com, you're an idiot. Like, you're a moron, you bet on the internet. What, what a bunch of dummies, like, that's all stupid. But what happened is technology kept getting better and better. You know, application servers started to get pretty good. Uh, the programming languages were really evolving really, really quickly. And then pretty soon, and then all of a sudden, you know, at a time when nobody was funding anything, Google comes out. I'm like, oh. Oh, I guess the internet is something. And that has generally been the cycle. So people get like overexcited and overly depressed all the time about all of this stuff. But the basic curves, the fundamental things, innovation uh, continues to go. So the good news is you guys all picked the right field. Smile, you picked the right field, that's good. No? Okay, so what do we look for? Um, so the first thing to understand about the technology business, two important points. So of all the technology companies, so there was a study that was done by Andy Ratcliffe who teaches uh, entrepreneurship at Stanford. Of all the technology companies started in the US in any one year, and this is over a 20 year period, about 15 ever generate 100 million in revenue. So you take every company, there's 15 of them that generate 100 million in revenue. Those 15 companies make up 97% of the value. Extreme power law curve. So less than 1% of the companies, far less than 1% of the companies, make up 90% of the value, 97% of the value. So as a venture capitalist, we, only want, we want to invest in those 15 companies. That's the whole venture capital thing. So all of the venture capitalists are all just trying to get into those 15 companies. So like, that's how, so if you want airplane money, if you want to change the world, if you want to have a big impact, you have to be one of those 15. If you want beer money, um, you don't need to do that. <laughs> There's plenty of ways to get beer money. Um, but that's really, that's the playing field. So it's really, what do you need to do to build something so transformational and take the market that you become one of those 15 companies to, that gets to that scale that becomes that valuable? Um, and like, that is the landscape. That's what it is about. So how do we find those 15? What do we look for? Well, there's really just a couple of things. One is the size of the opportunity. Are you, are, is the company addressing a really, really big and important market? 
And by that, I mean really the market, not, not the theoretical market, but the market to actually buy that product. And you have to be very careful here because sometimes people will come in and say, we're going after a $100 billion market. And if we ju get just you know, a half a percent, then we're going to have a big company. Well, when I hear that, you know what I tell them. There's no crying in prison. There's no profits for number two in technology. There is no 2% of a big market. You have to get like 30 or 40% of a big market for it to actually be meaningful, for you actually to make money in technology. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, but I'm just giving you the punchline. Um, so first, the size of the opportunity. Second, the quality of the team. So is the team good enough to build the great product that's 10 times better and take the market? And that's what we invest in. And like that's the most important thing. And then the final thing, a bad market always beats a good team. And when we don't invest in a good team, it's always because they've picked a market that isn't quite uh, what they think it is. And quite frankly, the most common one of these today, ad targeting. Everybody thinks it's a big market, but I'll tell you what, there's a thousand entrepreneurs pursuing it, and there's very little differentiation. It's very hard to target an ad better than the next guy. And by the way, if you're a brilliant person, um, why would you want to spend your life targeting ads? Sorry, just a little joke. This is a venture capital joke. So other things that we like, um, other things that generally lead to really good companies, megalomaniacs. So, it turns out that it's true. If you want to change the world, the first step is to believe that to be kind of megalomaniacal enough to actually believe that you can change the world. So like that is actually a good quality. Uh, and it is generally necessary to have the leadership skills to drive through all the issues that you run into along the way. Two outliers. So we tend not to be thematic. We tend not to say, gee, we want to invest in cloud computing. We want to invest in. SSD storage, we want to invest in this or that. We say, let's look at the very best entrepreneurs and see the ideas that they come up with. And generally, the great, great technology companies have not been thematic. They've been something completely out of the blue at the time they came in. Um, big shifts in technology market. So I did mention SSD. Well, that is a big shift. Like, storage is never going to be the same. Um, so that creates big opportunity when markets change. Market sectors that are dead. <laughs> so often the things that nobody wants to do. So you know what was a dead market in like 2001, 2002? Search. It was over. Yeah, who won? Sure they did. <laughs> so big market, winner, bad product, that's a great opportunity often. Next thing we look for, we like entrepreneurs that tilt towards the big market rather than the niche. So I'd much rather see an entrepreneur come in and say, here's how we're going to wipe out Google, or here's how we're going to wipe out Microsoft, than somebody who says, nobody competes with us, because what we're doing is so different and so odd and so weird that nobody would compete with us because nobody else is stupid enough to try that, because it's just an idiotic idea. But guess what? We have no competition. So rather have the entrepreneur be more competitive, rather have them go into face a big competition than be completely anti-competitive and not even be thinking about the market, but thinking about the competition that they're going to avoid. Hardcore technical team. So for us, we, invent in, we invest in technology companies. We're about technology. And so one test we have is if you take the technology team out of the company, the really best engineers out of the company, if the company doesn't collapse, we don't want to invest in it. Um, and then finally, and this one is probably the softest one, we'd rather, and it's generally better, it's generally better, and the biggest companies generally start as, wow, we've built this great product, everybody wants it, we have to build a company now to deliver the product to the market. That usually works out better than, wow, we really want to start a company, let's think of a product. Now, sometimes it works the other way, but generally products before teams. So biggest challenge for entrepreneurs. Um, first is, like, it's really good to have some of both skill sets, entrepreneur and inventor. That's really, really helpful. Um, and the reason for that is it's really hard for the just entrepreneur to find the big product innovation. And if they're running the company, that's a problem if they can't do that. Um, second big thing is finding the product market fit. So finding the product that everybody wants to buy. That the, that the big market wants to buy, like getting to that. 
because that's very different than the idea, but getting to the exact product. And third, and the, this is the biggest one of all, <laughs> managing your own psychology. Uh, when we were starting uh, LoudCloud, uh, Mark said to me, he goes, Ben, you know what's great about startups? And I said, no, what? And this was at a time when like, I was like, extremely nervous about everything, and my stomach always hurt. And he goes, you only ever experience two emotions, euphoria and terror. <laughs> and I find that lack of sleep enhances them both. <laughs> and that is so true. Which leads me to my final picture. Whoops. My final picture. So that is, uh, that's my daughter Sophia. That's my daughter Julia. That's Evan Williams, who is the uh, CEO, founding CEO of Twitter, and Mark Zuckerberg, the founding CEO of Facebook. And so this is the last story. So we were all together, as you can see. Um, and we were at this thing, the Herb Allen Sun Valley Conference. And you've probably never heard of it, but it's like the business conference to go to. Everybody likes to go to that. And so one of the things about this conference is they let you take your kids, but only until they're 20. And then they can't come anymore. Uh, and so my big one, Julia, is going, oh, Dad, this is so great, but like, I can't come back because you know, I'm going to be 20 next year. That's going to suck. And I said, well, you can come, just like become like a real successful business person, and then like Herb will invite you back. And she goes, that's ridiculous. I'm only 19 years old. I can't start a company. And we were sitting right next to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, Mark, what do you think of that? And he goes, think of what? And he says, Julia says she can't start a company. He goes, how old are you? And she goes, 19. He goes, oh, bull crap. I was 19 when I started Facebook. And I was like, oh, that, dads never get that on their teenagers. That was awesome. <laughs> But the big thing, the biggest thing about building a company, the biggest inhibitor to doing it is just believing that you can. And so take it from Mark Zuckerberg, it is possible. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>